Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Magical Learning Podcast. Today, we are talking about making a change, and what better way to celebrate that by making a change to our regular recording schedule. So we're actually recording this. You'll be hearing this on Friday, but we have recorded this on Monday because we potentially have plans on Friday. So we can really talk about making a change in all kinds of ways based on that, which is pretty exciting. Today, I'm joined by a nice central group of people. I'm joined by Jeanette and Graham. So let's just go around the group. Graham, how was your weekend? Hi, Jess. Uh, yeah, weekend was good. Got um, a little bit of work done around outside, a lot of work done inside. But um, and, and we are now oh, coming up to 164 hours uh, of having a house leakless reptile free. Not that I'm counting, you know, just excited about that. That is pretty cool. And if you aren't watching the video, you should definitely check out Graham's got a very cool bow tie. So I definitely recommend clicking that link if you're listening to the podcast and having a little look. Worth it. Um, and I might say also hi to Danette. How are you going? How was, uh, how was your weekend? Hey, Jez. Yeah, my weekend was good. Uh, like Graham got outside a bit, did a bit of work. Um, however, did sight a legless um, lizard, a la a snake, um, yesterday afternoon. But it was... It was away from me, and as soon as it saw me, it disappeared. So not trying to be aggressive at all. So that's okay. They're part of our farm, and that's okay. Yeah, how was yours, Jez? You should was, tell everyone how was yours. Yeah, sure, sure. It was good. I was just saying, if you don't know much about this snake saga, you can go back and listen to the past couple. Of, it's, a develop, it's a developing story. It is, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, my weekend was good. I had a little karaoke party, got to sing a little bit and uh, just see people being out in Melbourne. It's, that was a nice change from what we've experienced this year. And speaking nice. of making a change, that's a little, that's what we call a segue in the business. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, well, we are talking about making a change today, and this is one from the John Scollin series. Unfortunately, he can't be here today, but I think that this topic is uh, well representative of him. So thinking of you, John, even though you're not here, uh, I'm, I'm sure he'll be on a future episode. So today we, uh, we're going to run the similar format. We're just going to run through uh, some questions. And I think let's, which is not making a change, but you know, we need some stability in this format. So let's start with question one, and I might start with you, Graham. What prevents people from making a change? Usually their brain or our brain. So if, if, you know, if we look at the, so the, the neuroscience behind um, change, one of the things that often accompanies, accompanies change is a lack of certainty about what happens after the change. And our brain craves certainty, really, really likes certainty. So it tends to make decisions that keep it feeling more certain and it likes to make decisions to move away from things that give it less certainty. So uh, you know, one of the things we know, and, and I use the phrase a lot in workshops that we run, is that when it comes to making a change, uh, it's good to recognise that sometimes your brain is not your friend. It will actually work against you to introduce whatever the change happens to be. Yeah, that's a, that's really good. Uh, and it's a good, good little lesson, I think. Uh, but I'm excited to delve into that a little deeper. It's a very tease. It's a great teaser there, Graham. Uh, and Jeanette, what, what are some things that prevent people from making a change? Yeah, so I absolutely agree with what Graham said. So we know that our brain is 2% of our body's mass, but it uses 25% of our energy. So every time we have to change, it's going to require it to concentrate more and also it's going to use or divert that energy and that's hard work. So our brain much prefers habits over having to change and it doesn't care whether our habits are good or bad. A couple of other things I thought of was, Sometimes you want to make a change, but there's um, your social group might be against that particular change. And so what you'll find, and this is just what we do as social beasts, is if someone tries to change and we don't like it, they get kicked out of the group unless they come back to the norms of the group. So that for some people can be really um, quite scary. And the other one is it's just, you know, the change people are wanting to make is so big so huge and they can't even picture themselves as being like that therefore again as Graham said they're working against their brain because it's not part of their identity who the new person's going to be with that change great Mm. question Mm, yeah definitely I think all that stuff is is totally all part of it it's a change is stressful you know it's and as 
we're just animals. So we want that comfort, exactly what Graham was saying. We all kind of want to be like a little cat that's just napping all the time sometimes, you know, um, but change is the opposite of that. Uh, and I think also one thing that I was thinking is that sometimes with change, it's sometimes with the uncertainty that it leaves as well. It's the devil you know versus the devil you don't know with the habits you already have. Uh, so I think that that's also a sort of important part of it. But yeah, and I think this sort of leads me on to the next part, which is what are some signs you need a change forward slash how do you know a change is worth making? And I might start with you, Danette, here for this one. Um, so yeah, what, what sort of, what are signs you need to change and how do you know it's worth making? Okay, so I think some of them are maybe you're feeling stuck, you're not happy with the results you're getting at the moment, um, maybe you're not even enjoying life so much. Um, and I think Robin Sharma has a great saying, which is with better awareness comes better choices and with better choices comes better results. So I think that sometimes you just need to sit back and look and say, is this habit really serving me, um, both in the short term and the long term? Um, particularly around as, as you get older, you know, we need to stay healthier if we want to have a really rich life. So thinking about are, are my habits serving me in terms of my health, et cetera. And I think, yeah, how do I know if it's worth ma making um, those changes? I think if it's going to give you a better life, a healthier life, more enjoyment, um, then for me, that, that's a yes, as opposed to it's going to make me feel crappy, um, it's bad for my health, then that would be a hell no. <laughs> Yeah, nice. Good one. Good one. I think um, that's, I, I'm interested to see also how this goes, but that was some great answers there. Uh, Graham, what are, what are signs you need to change slash how do you know a change is worth making? Well, just to flip the, what are the signs that you need to change? Um, following up on, on Danette's comments about if something's not working for you, if you're not feeling really happy, you know, feeling stuck. Um, one of the other signs sometimes that you need to change is that none of that is happening and you feel completely comfortable because that's sort of where we get to. You know, we, we enjoy being in our little circle of comfort because it makes us feel comfortable. Our brain likes it. So um, I, 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 there was a phrase that uh, I was trying to recall from the leadership program that we did years and years ago, and it's not coming to mind right now, but it might be before we finish up today. But essentially it was that... Um, that sense of comfort around pretty much your entire life. So if there's nothing that's happening in your life that shifts you into that state of feeling a little uncomfortable or a little challenged or a little, little scared, you know, in, a, in an appropriate way, um, if I'm just comfortable in all aspects of my life, then that's also probably a good sign that it's time for a change. How do you know the change is going to be good for you? You don't a lot of the time. I mean, to, to Danette's point, absolutely. There are, you know, if I if I have habits that I know are not serving me, um, then I can reasonably suspect that if I replace a, a bad habit with a better habit, then it's going to be good for me. But there are also a lot of potential changes we can entertain that we can think about bringing into our life where we don't actually know whether they're going to be of benefit to us or not. It's like, and that's part of the risk. You know, change involves risk because it involves doing something new, trying something new, letting go of something. Uh, and the letting go, actually, another thing about that is also one of the reasons why we don't often embrace change because our brain thinks, oh, I have to give something up. So I'm going to lose something by changing. And that's often scarier than the, um, the potential upside. Um, Daniel Kahneman, who wrote Thinking Fast and Slow, had a, a great way. And, and in fact, I, I'm pretty sure this um, experiment has been repeated a number of times since. But he talked about some research that they did where human beings, generally speaking, are more concerned about losing. And, and in this case, the, the study that they did was based on money. So where people had an opportunity to win $20, or not lose $10, they chose to not lose $10, even if the odds were pretty much the same. So yeah, you know, we, we tend to have this thing about not losing or letting go of something. And that's one of the reasons why we resist change. And we don't know whether it's going to work for us. So that also can be a little bit scary. Uh, if I could finish just with one uh, other point that Danette made before about you know, your circle of friends not necessarily supporting you. I think where the change involves uncertainty, 
um, that's where having a really good tribe around you becomes so important. And sometimes, uh, you know, you really do need to think if, if there's a change that you want to make that's substantial, then one of the questions around that would be, who's the best tribe to support me through all of that? And sometimes it's not my current tribe. And tribe can be family, circle of friends, you know, work relationships, that sort of thing. Yeah, wow. That, that, there was a lot in there. That was awesome, Graham. It just didn't stop. <laughs> no, there's it, it a, a lot of things I thought about. Actually, I just have to take an extra little note here. But um, one thing that that reminded me of, I was on a train once uh, back from Wodonga to Melbourne. And what you're talking about, Graham, where um, people are afraid of losing something versus it's sort of good to look at a change in a positive way. Uh, someone was talking to some other stranger they just met on the train and they one of them had uh, a condition that meant she could no longer eat a certain amount of food. So something equivalent to celiac, but I rem- it was interesting. I was listening to her and she said that her response wasn't to look at all the things that she had to cut out. She looked at a book of all the things she could eat. And she was like, wow, there's so much stuff to eat here. And I thought that was a really interesting way to look at that conundrum because most people would be shattered that they can't have fish and chips anymore or anything, you know? Um, yeah. yeah, it's a, it's a great point. Great point. It's a great example, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that was interesting. I thought that was a good way. And you have just reminded me of it then, Graham. Good, good one. And then I think also this sort of goes back to our topic last week, which for people uh, was the impact you have on others. Um, and we were talking a little bit about uh, being yourself and how that can help people. And I think with that tribe thing that you're talking about there, Graham, having people that are sort of unusual that create their own change in a sort of big way, in an impact way. Um, uh, last week, I, I, we were talking about uh, sports people and mental health, but having beacons that can help you look at how to make a change better and understand it's okay to make that change uh, is helpful. So when people do that, it gives you a little guiding light almost to hopefully make a better change in that way yep. as well. Um, yeah. And I think, I think, yeah, what you were saying as well, there's a couple of different types of reasons you could need to get, have a change. It's either you're sick of whatever's happening, or whatever's working no longer works. And I was actually watching a Ted talk. I wish I'd recorded down who it was, but they're talking about why societies collapse. And a lot of it is because the function of the society that is its strength is also its weakness. And for a lot of people that may be comfort, but when it no longer serves. Um, so a good example that he actually used was, um or he used australia as an example with um coal where it's a s- strength for us we have a lot of it and we can ship it out but it's unfortunately having adverse effects on us later in in so we have to kind of and as part of it as the culture has to adjust as it goes forward it's it's part of it as well but it's a uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting and so i think sometimes you're inspired to make a change sometimes you watch a show and you go oh well i should cut down all the stuff in my house and become a minimalist and sometimes it's you feel like you have to make that change and i think yeah it's a either way i think it's always going to be uncomfortable exactly what you said graham as well it's yep. risky it's uh but sometimes it's the best option all right well there we go let's go into the final question i want to say thank you both so much for the answers so far it's great i was really excited for this topic i feel like i'm already learning so much um so this is one that I um, was wondering a lot during lockdown, which is how do you prioritize change in your life? What should it be more important than what should it be less important than? And I'll start with you, Graham, for this one. It's an awesome question. How do you prioritize change in your life? So my first suggestion would be you need to get quiet and get still. Uh, I'd, I'd find, uh, personally, I think it'd be very difficult to do any sort of meaningful prioritising around possible changes if I am on the treadmill, you know, the, the, like the, the rat race treadmill, the work treadmill. So I think finding opportunities to get quiet. Um, and the other, I think, essential element is having some sense of where I want to get to. Um, yeah, last week we were talking about, I, I mentioned a question that I um, read in Autobiography of a Yogi, where one of the highly revered Eastern spiritual masters, um, one of his daily practices was to spend time contemplating the question, who am I? And so I, I think on a level, you know, getting some clarity around, well, who do I want to be as a human being, you know, in, in my existence on planet Earth right now, who do I want to be? And I think having some sense of that, I don't think you need absolute certainty around it because that answer, I suspect, will probably change over time. But using that as a 
it's almost like a, a guiding light to decide well, which of these changes is potentially going to help me get towards that or, or move towards that um, sooner than some of the others. And sometimes I think priorities in terms of changing can also be a lot more practical. Um, you know, if, I, if there are things happening for me at the moment where I, I'm not sleeping well for argument's sake and I know there are some things that I, I need to change, then um, and this goes back to Danette's comment about things like you know, your mental health and well-being and personal health. Are there changes that I can introduce really quickly that may not have a huge impact on where I'm going to be in 10 years' time, but absolutely essential and necessary for me right now? Um, but I, I think getting still, getting rid of distractions and making some time to sit and contemplate. And also, this comes back to the tribe thing, I think, uh, you know, having one or two really trusted close friends that you can have that sort of conversation with to get some guidance on that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I think, Graham, you've even reminded me, I think another kind of hack you can do for that nowadays is uh, if there's someone that inspires you, they may have done a podcast that talks about how they got to where they are and that can help you as well because it certainly helps Absolutely. Helped me. Yeah. Great point, great point. Um, yeah, if, you can't, if your tribe isn't exactly aligned with the same way. But I think that's a, that's a great, great point there. Uh, Danette, any, uh, how would you prioritise change in your life and what should it be more important than what should be less important then? Great question, yes. Um, so one of the ways that sort of helps me identify um, before I even prioritise is when I rate my weeks, so from zero being a really crap week to 10 being an awesome week, Anything below a seven, um, and in fact, even when I'm doing a seven or an eight, I always put the positives and the negatives of the week, and that allows me to identify what's working, but also what's not. And from that, then I look at what little changes um, can we make that can um, build you know, better habits for argument's sake. So when COVID first started, um, I wanted to increase my upper body strength, so I decided I was going to do 15 push-ups. I read about this um, in one of the new habit books that are out at the moment. There's a couple of them. And they said, link it to something you already do and do it at a time that works for you. So early morning works for me. So before I'd get in the shower, I'd do 15 push-ups on the base and in the bathroom. And then I'd do the celebration because it's really important to celebrate when you take new action. And then each day I sort of said to myself, well, just build it by five. And very quickly, I got to 100 each day simply by starting smaller and growing because that sort of is less uncomfortable than if we do a massive big change. And I also read in one of those books um, about, you know, we don't have to wait to, for the New Year's resolution. You can do it on the first day of the week. You can go, okay, I'm going to link this habit to I'm going to start it on Monday. Or you can do it the first day of the month. Whatever sort of is a first our brain will go, okay, yep, let's start that change. In terms of um, my body clock, I do it earlier, but for some people embedding a habit might be better in the afternoon. So um, what is it more important then? Um, the things that make me comfortable, things such as social media, et cetera, emails often that are urgent but often not important. Um, and I think yeah, what is it less important than? Um, it's hard to know that one because, you know, if this is part of you boosting your self-care, then I'd say there's not much less important unless it's sort of relationships that um, you know, are really important and need time now. Um, yeah, great, great session. There's great questions. Mm, mm. Well, um, just before we get into the wrap up the final bit, I actually... I think that's something that you both have kind of touched on in your last answer that I think could be just important, maybe giving one or two minutes to. It's just talking about journaling because it sounds like that was a good way for you to at least track what's happening and then um, from there being able to make a better decision. So I guess whoever wants to talk about it or if you both want to talk about it, I know it's something that's important to both of you. So, so for me, I used to journal regularly, um, often at the moment not, but I know that when my mood's a little bit out of whack, then I come straight back to journaling and I'm like, okay, come back to your scores. Where are you at? What's the positives? What's the negatives? What needs to change? So for that, for me, I love journaling because it really does give those insights. It also reminds me I need to get back into that habit because it's good. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, so very similar. Um, journaling's been like an important 
um, ritual for me for a long time. I don't do it every day, but I do notice it when I, I miss it when I don't do it. And I, I notice the value I get when I do do it. But I also got out of the habit of beating myself up for not doing it every day because that was a silly thing that I used to do a long time ago. And, and uh, what's the guy's name? James Pennybaker, who's a researcher, I think, at the University of Texas, has spent the last 20 or 30 years studying uh, writing as a form of therapy. And, and some of the research that he's done is, is quite amazing. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on really quickly, if I could, Jess, is, which is not sort of so much journaling, but going back to a couple of Danette's points about um, introducing new habits and start small and, and celebrate you know, when you start small. And it reminded me of Wayne Dyer when he was still with us talking about um, going from being a, a very unfit, not very healthy human being and decided that he wanted to get fit but rather than set himself some ridiculous goals. He just decided one day you know, to put on his running shoes and he said, I'm just going to run as far as I can. That's it. And then I'll stop. And then the next day, his goal was simply to run a little bit further than he had the day before. So he had, no, you know, I want to be running 5Ks in two weeks' time sort of thing. It's just, I'm just going to do a little more each day, a little more each day. Which, um, going back to Robin Sharma, you know, one of his quotes talks about 1% wins, small, daily, consistent you know, improvements over time lead to amazing success. So it's not about going from zero to hero overnight because that doesn't happen. Not consistently and, and it doesn't stick. It's just about making small changes. And I love the, the celebrate thing. So whether you do Danette's party dance, whether you do the Macarena, it doesn't really matter. You know, give yourself a, a mental hug. Uh, really important to celebrate every time you do the small things. Yeah, well, great Thank answers. You. Thank you very much. That's That's been really good. And I think also... Uh, uh as we know at magical learning change equals uncomfortable equals growth it's a magical learning phrase so of course that's relevant here as well and i also think regardless of whether you choose to make a change or not change is going to happen in your life anyway you hopefully just get to pick a couple that you um can sort of embark on uh, i want to thank you both so much for being here today and i'll get some closing thoughts from both of you so i might start with danette what are your final thoughts on making a change so, Jez, I was going to use that formula that you spoke about before. <laughs> so, so what I'd love to say and, and to add to what you just said, Jez, is that change is going to happen. Uh, we, we have no control over that. What we do have control over is how we approach change. And why I love that formula is because it reminds us that we're growing when we feel uncomfortable. So I think reframing change is Yes, it is uncomfortable. Actually, the most important thing is it's our growth, which will help us adapt and learn to the changing environments we experience. So I love that because it's proactive rather than reactive. Thanks, Jez. Nice. Yeah, perfect. Nice. Yeah. Um, last thoughts. Again, as Danette said, you know, change is, is a constant. If you're alive today, then you exist in a state of change and, and you will pretty much forever until you're not alive anymore. So, you know, this idea of designing your life, um, you can't control everything outside of you. You can't control yourself. The other, there's another saying about, you know, what, it's not what happens to you in life or what happens for you in life that matters. How you respond to what happens for you is, is the most important thing. So we can be proactive. We can make choices every day around designing a life that enables us to be a better version of ourselves rather than sitting back and waiting for somebody to introduce a change that's going to get us there. So I think just you know, hanging on to that idea of we don't control everything outside us, but we do control us. Nice. Awesome. Well, that has been a great, great episode. Thank you both so much. Uh, hopefully your days remain unchanged in the lack of snake department. I hope it stays the same. Uh, Thanks, Jess. Fingers, <laughs> fingers, toes and eyes crossed as we speak. Uh, well, thank you both so much. And uh, for everyone listening, have a magical week. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks so Jess. Much, Jess. Uh, thanks, Graham. Thank you.